everybody. Welcome to our talk, The Recipe for Scalable Frontends. My name is Dan Persha. I'm an engineering lead in the fashion store department of Zalando, and my challenge now is to lead the team who's building a next generation CMS. I'm also one of the developers who contributed to Project Mosaic, the one we'll be talking about today. Hi, and my name is Maximilian Fellner. I've been developing web services and applications at Zalando for several years. Recently, I developed a new open source project that aims to make frontends more scalable, and you'll learn about that today as well. Zalando is Europe's leading online fashion platform. Here are some numbers to show why our recipe for frontend works. It's because we are dealing with scaling every day. Our company is present in 15 countries. We have more than 21 million active customers. And last year, we had a 3.6 billion euro in revenue. We have a great team of 1,600 talented people in tech. And here is how our fashion store looks like. Now that you have an idea about the scale at which our company operates, let's get to our recipe for scalable frontends. Every recipe has two important things, the ingredients and the instructions. We'll soon discover ingredients related to scalability and ingredients related to frontends. We'll soon also get our hands dirty and get into the technical instructions as well. Let's take a look at the first two essential ingredients we will use for our recipe, scaling the tech team and scaling the architecture. Without these two ingredients, scaling the front end might not even make sense, as the system operates at such a low capacity that scaling is not a problem worth tackling. Let's dive, deep, dive deeper and see why each of these is important. First, we want to be able to scale the tech team. What does this mean? It means attracting new, talented people to grow the team. The reason you want to scale the team in general, and specifically in our case, the front-end team, is because there are plenty of new features to be added to existing products or new products to be built. Of course, this can be achieved if there are more front-enders leaving the company than coming, so another requirement is to keep the existing team happy. Putting somebody to spend four hours every week to deploy a monolith doesn't make anybody happy. Having the front-end developers waiting for a monolith to compile, let's say, its Java classes also is not appealing. We want diverse people who are able to see the same problem from, from different perspectives. The more ideas you have, the more likely it is to find the best one. Diversity leads to innovation. We also want to actively encourage innovation. Uh, innovation is keeping the company on top of the competition, and you can encourage it by uh, organizing hack weeks and by giving the teams time to experiment and build prototypes. A happy team is an, an innovative team. For a happy, innova innovative team, it's easy to talk about their, uh, their projects, like me and Max today, and attract other talented people. As you can see, all of the four points are interconnected. Here is how our tech department evolved over time. As you can see, we started in 2008 with PHP and MySQL, Magento actually. One of my colleagues created this chart two years ago to demonstrate the growth of our apps in comparison to the growth of our tech team. What we can see here is more or less linear growth for both the number of apps and for the number of employees. Starting 2015, it had to be slightly adjusted. As you can see, the number of apps exploded, and since then, we started to have plenty of open source projects in GitHub. The number of people in tech is more than double compared to two years ago. So looking at these numbers, you might ask yourselves, how can this be possible? The answer is simple. Two years ago, we introduced a new concept, radical agility. We, at Zalando, understand radical agility as a way of running a business based on purpose, autonomy, and mastery. To describe this in one sentence would be trust instead of control. The final goals of radical agility are being represented on the edges of the slide, increase innovation and increase productivity. 
What's important for today's talk is that radical agility changed the communication structure of our tech department. We started to be organized into small, autonomous engineering teams, which are trusted and accept responsibility. So here is our first ingredient, scaling the team. Hire diverse people, give, give them the freedom to self-organize, give them a clear, motivating purpose, and try they'll deliver great features. Reorganizing the team has consequences on the architecture as well. Let me introduce Conway's law. Organizations produce designs which are copies of their communication structures. As soon as a company reorganizing the, the team, the architecture also has to be changed, which brings us to the next ingredient. Architecture scalability. What do we want to achieve here? We want many teams working in parallel at different features without interfering with each other. Team autonomy. We want them to deploy independently. We want to allow them to do continuous delivery in case they want to do this. We want programming language diversity. We want to use the right tool for the job. We used to be a Java-based company. Now we are putting more and more uh, languages in production. And finally, A-B testing. Adding and removing features really fast drives the product forward. Experimenting with features is a great way to improve uh, and innovate on the product side. But wait a second. These promises are some promises microservices make on the back end. So the back end part is somehow easy. We fulfill these promises by creating APIs owned by different back end teams. The question is, do microservices solve the front-end problems we have as well? Do these promises apply here as well? Let's take a look at the traditional way of solving the front-end problem. The traditional solution without microservices would be to have a front-end monolith. As back-end teams now own APIs, we can call those APIs for, from this more lightweight front-end monolith. The web app gets contributions from multiple teams. Let's look again at, at some of the things we were trying to achieve. Are the front-end teams working autonomously? No, they are not. They still depend on each other as they are contributing to the same lightweight monolith. Can they use and mix different text tags? Not really, as somebody has to choose the initial common front-end framework. Can they deploy independently whenever they want? No, they are still bound to a release cycle. It seems that avoiding microservices and solving the challenges we have is not an option. We somehow to make, have to make it work. Here is Project Mosaic, microservices for the front end. Mosaic is a set of services and libraries, most of them open sourced, together with a specification that defines how its components interact with each other. The goal is to support a microservice style architecture for large scale websites. While decomposing the backend into microservices is a widely adopted approach to achieve flexibility in development and operation, most front end solutions are still running as a monolithic application. Mosaic addresses this issue by using fragments, services are, that render HTML that is composed together at runtime according to template definitions. The front ends are, my, uh, are front end microservices owned by different teams. Teams are able to develop, deploy, and operate these services independently of each other. So what's, inside, what's happening inside of a fragment? We can render HTML, fetch data, and we can respond to AJAX requests. Ideally, there is no business logic within these fragments. None of these actions are mandatory. The ones implementing the fragment can choose. As a result, fragments can be iterated on very rapidly, be more flexible in technology choices, and can better benefit from the extreme development pace of today's front-end technologies. As I said, in this setup, each team owns its fragments. They are able to choose the technology for them, and they can deploy them independently. Each fragment is able to do calls to different APIs, and each fragment renders a part of the final page. How does the final page get assembled from the rendered, uh, from the rendered HTML uh, which, uh, which was rendered by each of the fragments? 
On top of the fragments, we have another service, the layout service. The layout service puts together the content rendered by fragments. It uses templates to know how to assemble them. We will talk about templates soon. The assembled content is streamed to the client through a router. The router is necessary to handle API calls, mobile app calls, or to help in the migration from a legacy system. So now, let's get from the microservices from the front-end idea to the Mosaic implementation. We have names for both the router and the layout service. So Skipper is our router and Taylor our layout service. Skipper is a piece of software we built in-house, developed as an open source project. It is the entry point for, ev for every request from the browser, except the static resources. It acts as a reverse proxy and will delegate the request based on some internal routes to one of our new services or to Jimmy, the, mon uh, the legacy system, uh, in case a migration is happening. It has other functions like security features as well. For more, more details, check out our GitHub repository at github.com slash Zalando slash Skipper. Taylor is the layout service implementation, another open source project that we built. It uses streams to compose a web page from fragment services. It loads the content of all fragments from the template in parallel, offers nice error handling and fallback features. Here is how a tailored template looks like. As you can see, most of it is HTML with a special tag, fragment. This tag acts as a placeholder where, where Taylor will insert the content it gets from each specified fragment. One of the fragments has to be marked as a primary. This is a fragment which will give the HTTP status of the final page. You might have noticed that this concept is similar to Facebook's Big Pipe. The difference is that with BigPipe, things get assembled on the client side. For CEO and user experience reasons, we want most of our content to be streamed in order. We can achieve a similar behavior as with a BigPipe by using the async attribute. Let's look at an example. We have a request for the car page from Skipper. Skipper knows that the slash cart URL should be handled by Taylor, and it forwards the request to it. Taylor needs a template for the slash cart URL, and it, in case it doesn't have it cached, it asks Quilt a RESTful API for it. Taylor gets a template, looks at it, sees that it has to call the header fragment, the car fragment, and the tracking fragment. It does all of these calls in parallel, puts everything together according to the template, and returns the response to Skipper. The status code gets set by the car fragment as this is the primary one. A fragment may provide some JavaScript and CSS as well. Besides the static HTML, Taylor will look for additional script and stylesheet assets in the link HTTP uh, header of the fragment response and will inject the corresponding links into the head section of the final page. The JavaScript must be defined as an AMD module that exports a single function. When finally executed on the client, this function receives the, the DOM element of the fragment as an argument. Because each fragment is an isolated, standalone application inside of the browser, fragments need, needs a way to communicate with each other. For example, one fragment might add an article to the shopping cart. As a result of this action, another fragment wants to update the list of the shopping cart items. Although there is no solution built into Mosaic itself, it is easy to add a shared communication bus that fragments can publish and subscribe to. On Zalando.de, we are using the Happen library, which is also open, open sourced. Here is how our Zalando page looks like after it gets assembled by Taylor. The final page is assembled from three fragments, the header fragment, the card fragment, and, uh, and another fragment which is not visible, exposing the tracking pixel, the tracking fragment. Each of these fragments are managed by different teams. So here is our second ingredient, scaling the architecture. Come up with an architecture which allows team autonomy, 
independent deployment encourages a mix of text text and experimentation. Right now, Mosaic is live. We have quite some traffic on it. Last year, on Black Friday, we had around 21,000 requests per second on Skipper, and we are expecting even more this year, as Black Friday is about to come again. So far, I have showed you how a single large web uh, website can be split into smaller fragments. Max, what's next? Okay. So, well, as it turns out, um, websites are a lot more complex today than they used to be. They contain lots of interactive elements powered by JavaScript, and they serve large amounts of dynamic content. Now, let me show you how we think we'll manage all that. Our website, or as we call it, the fashion store, is actually a highly dynamic application. Here's an example how the fashion store might be, might be divided into separate independent fragments. Each fragment can have some sophisticated interactive behavior and may be talking to multiple microservice APIs on the back end. Naturally, we update the content in the fashion store very frequently with the latest styles, trends, and product information. The content itself is also dynamic and might change for different users because of personalization, for instance. So with this in mind, what is actually the best way to implement the fragment? There are three important things that we want from our fragment. First, it must provide to our users a modern and interactive user experience similar to a web application. Second, it must support the, dy the dynamic and frequently updated content that we want to deliver to our customers. And lastly, the fragment has to preserve the consistent look and feel that our customers have come to expect everywhere inside the fashion store. Given these constraints, let's consider our implementation options, starting with the most naive approach. A very simple fragment might render only some static content. Obviously, this has many drawbacks. The implementation is too manual, and updating the content means changing the whole fragment and maybe redeploying the complete web service. Also, the user experience is very likely to be quite inconsistent between independent different teams. So here's another idea. Instead of rendering just static HTML, a fragment may react to requests dynamically, fetch some external content, and send back a computed response using an HTML template engine. While this is already a lot better than the first approach, many fragments are still going to deliver an inconsistent user experience as implementations differ. The biggest drawback, however, is that JavaScript is not part of the fragment. So we've come up with a different approach. Fragments should use existing, reusable, and shared JavaScript components. Although those components run dynamically as code inside the browser, they can also be readily transformed into static HTML. This code allows, that allows server-side rendering is sometimes called isomorphic or universal JavaScript. And many popular solutions, for example, React and Vue.js, support it. Now let's take a closer look at how this idea is supposed to work in general and how it fits together with the Mosaic architecture. Because the fragment is supposed to use only existing JavaScript components for the content of the website, we start out by describing the components that we want to use with only basic JSON. If we take React components, for example, we can show that they are easily described with JSON. Every component has only three attributes. The type, which can be the name of a DOM element, like div or h1. A set of properties or props, for example, the attributes of an HTML tag. And a list of children 
with more components or simply strings. So the next step is for the fragment to take those JSON descriptions and to transform them into the JavaScript and HTML that will be sent to the Taylor layout service. During this process, the code from common component libraries, for example, from modules on NPM, can be included. So how does this code generation work? As we've seen before, React components are actually quite simple. If we know the type, properties, and children, we can easily produce a hierarchy of nested function calls of the create element function. Once the code is generated, we evaluate it to create the React element and then use the render to string function to turn it into static HTML. Now, the big advantage of this solution is, of course, that generated JavaScript is universal. So it can run not only on the server, but also on the client. Now, this looks like a very promising approach. In fact, we've already implemented it and released it as another open source project. We call it Tessellate. The project comprises two major parts that I'll talk about in more detail next the bundler and the renderer. So in Tessellate, the process of transforming JSON into JavaScript code is performed by the bundler. The bundler uses four steps to do that. First, the JSON is passed as an abstract syntax tree. Next, we take that to generate JavaScript code. In the third step, Tessellate uses Webpack directly in memory to compile universal bundles from that code. Finally, those bundles are exported to a remote content delivery server for later use. Let's inspect an example of the code that Tessellate generates. It's actually just a single React component. The component types used in the JSON description are turned into import statements. They can be default imports and named imports. The rest of the JSON description is turned into create element functions with props and children. However, there's more that we can do here. Right now, all the property values are statically encoded directly in the description, so in the JSON. But of course, the root component can receive props from an outside source. So Tessellate has a way to inject external properties into the compiled React components during rendering. The values of those properties are not known ahead of time, but they can be referenced relative to the root props using JSON pointers. In addition to that, we can also bundle some properties during the compilation process as default values, and then we merge them together with the external properties. A common problem with React components rendered on the server is the so-called rehydration. We need to ensure that the same properties are used on the server side and for client-side rendering. Tessellate solves this by adding an attribute to the root component that stores all the props as an inline string. This attribute will be pressed inside the static HTML, allowing us to use it and retrieve the props inside the browser. Finally, the generated JavaScript exports the function that the Taylor API demands. This function is going to be called on the client side inside the browser, and it receives the DOM element of the fragment as an argument. This element is actually our root component. Inside the function, the inlined props are extracted, and the React component tree is mounted on the root element by calling the render function. So to summarize, Tessellate Bundler is a microservice that transforms JSON into JavaScript. The JavaScript is compiled into portable, universal UMD bundles using Webpack directly in memory. The main bundle exports a root component and the render function for Taylor. The root component also provides an interface to inject property values. 
the properties can be referenced using JSON pointers, and they are inlined as a string into the HTML for rehydration. We'll come back to this in a moment. We've also seen how components from external libraries can be referenced in JSON by their respective node module names and the names of the exports of those modules. So this was, uh, this was the first part of Tessellate, the bundler. The other part of Tessellate is the renderer. This is actually the fragment that renders the HTML. When this fragment receives a request, it fetches the pre-compiled bundle from the CDN where the bundler placed it before. Next, additional data can be loaded from external sources. And finally, Tessellate evaluates the code and renders static HTML. Here's what the implementation of that process looks like. First, the pre-compiled bundle is downloaded. At this point, Tessellate can use the available information in the current HTTP request to decide which bundle exactly to choose. Then the code is evaluated inside the Node.js virtual machine and the exported root component is extracted. As we've seen before, this root component has an interface for external props and we can load some external data to provide those. In the final step, the root component is instantiated as a React element and injected with external props. Now the element can be rendered into HTML and sent back to the Taylor layout service. If it looks like that the renderer is a lot simpler than the bundler, then that's because it is. The Tessellate fragment has only three simple things to do. Download the pre-compiled bundle, fetch some additional external content, and render everything to HTML and send it to Taylor. This is how the complete picture looks like. We have the Tessellate bundler, this microservice that takes an abstract description of the React components written in plain JSON. It compiles the description into universal JavaScript that can run on both the server and inside the browser. And then there is the Tessellate fragment, which renders the pre-compiled bundles and any additional external data into HTML according to the API demanded by the Taylor layout service. So this architecture meets all our requirements for the fashion store. With JavaScript components, we can achieve a modern and interactive user experience. Content can be externalized and updated separately. And because we're using shared component libraries, the look and feel is going to be consistent everywhere. In fact, this was the last ingredient of our recipe, scaling the content. We use small, reusable and shared JavaScript components to push large amounts of content. The components are consistent between many independent teams and they decouple layout and data for greater scalability. So here is how our uh, recipe for the scalable frontends look like. What we have here is scaling the tech team, scaling the architecture, and scaling the content as ingredients. And on the other side, as instructions, we have radical agility, mosaic, and tessellate. You can find more details about what we talked about or on mosaic9.org, the site for the project. Also, feel free to well follow us on Twitter and ask us more questions. So right now, is there any question? OK, uh, if you have any questions, it's the time to ask. Hello. Um, I saw this seems all part of a package, that, which is Mosaic, I mean, Taylor, Skipper. But can they be used separately, perhaps? Uh, yes, all the services can, in fact, be used separately. So, for example, um, Skipper is simply a reverse proxy, so it can be used for completely different use cases than Mosaic as well. And, for example, Tessellate 
is in essence just a server-side React renderer, so it can also be used separately. Okay. Other questions? No one? Well, then, uh, thank you to Dan and Maximilian. Uh, you was very, very clear. <laughs>